Welcome, Gen365 family, to our best listeners, wherever you are. Thank you so much. We launched this podcast by Beyond the Veil Mission last year in November, and I cannot believe that this week we are celebrating 1,000 downloads, and also next week it, we're going to hit our 20th um, episode. I am so grateful. Our team is highly grateful. And thank you so much. You hear me as the host lead here, but we have really uh, people behind this podcast supporting us from content creation, topic, questions, um, especially Krista, our girl behind coordinating everything about the podcast. Thank you so much. You do a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, yes, uh, today's topic, I think you can see that there is no guest today, or I'm going to tell you there is no other guest. I'm going to be uh, your guest, your host, um, and I will be sharing a little bit of some of my vulnerable uh, moments that really not only inspired this conversation, I, I want to say that it was the topic about breaking the shame cycle, I wouldn't say that it was inspired by personal experience. However, uh, we've been paying attention, especially in our community, so many conversations around judging, shaming people. Um, and we were like, you know, it is important that we talk about this because at the end of the day, when we think about the topic of shame, how it makes people think, feel, uh, most of the time, these feelings, these emotions are coming from outside and we end up internalizing those emotions and they become part of us, they become part of how we behave, how we act, how we respond, how we decide. And I think it is important that we talk about it and whether you like it or not, most of us directly or indirectly we might we might have been in position where we have been shamed and we might have been in the position where we 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 had to shame or we were shaming other people or judging other people so it is important as we really address this topic to check in ourselves um some of us that are listening, you might be, you know, as you listen, you might be needing healing or you might be needing maybe to make some changes in your life in ways that you treat others, others that are different than you, others that are not responding to the society norms. So it is important that we really pay attention um, on how we treat others and all of that. So we're going to talk about breaking the shame cycle. Um, this conversation cannot replace the role of professional um, therapy or professional counseling. However, we share really amazing tools that you can use in your personal life if you find them to be helpful. I can help you really take care of your mental well-being. So yeah, let's let's dig in. When I thought about uh, when we thought about this topic of shame, one thing that came in my mind, I'm gonna share a story with you, was like, you know, how does shame make you feel? And I really I was like, you know, how does it feel like when we feel ashamed? Not gonna lie to you, I think. Many times I have have found myself in a situation where I really completely felt ashamed. And I was really, uh, I was going into research and also working with our team, looking into um, definition tools and all of that. And in my mind, I really started thinking about the work of uh, Brenda Brown. Brenda Brown has so, done so much walk around shame she has done so much research about that topic and i looked into some of her definition about shame and i'm gonna share with you uh shortly but i'm gonna share a story first let me tell you a story that really has stayed in my mind um this is a particular moment where i have experienced shame i was maybe around eight years old let me see yeah 
it will be between eight years old and nine years old. Growing up, I used to be a cute girl. Oh, I'm still beautiful. Um, I remember that time I was living um, at Gisimba Orphanage. Today, that orphanage, uh, if you are listening and we have lived together at Gisimba Orphanage in Rwanda, Kigali, Nyamirambo, I'm saying hi to you and let's be in touch. But we, we still have a group that we chat, we follow up on each other. And last year, actually, some of our team from Beyond the Veil, uh, we had an amazing day um, at um, Gisimba. Now they 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 offer uh, different um, programs for the children, the youth, and their families. So summertime they run um, different camp for the youth, and we 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 attended one of their programs for the whole day. It was an amazing. By the way, oh, we haven't shared those pictures on our social media. I will remember we share some of the, those pictures of our moment at the Simba Orphanage. But short story, when our parent died during the genocide against the Tutsi, Gisimba was a good friend of our family, our father, and um, my oldest brother took us there to hide there and stay there because there was no longer a parent. We needed to be somewhere to survive. So I think after the genocide, after losing my parent, one of the area, I always share that in my story. First of all, the person that I called first, my dad, beyond my actual biological dad, was Gisimba. This gray man around him, you always feel like home. You always feel like a child. It's like his presence is like father-child presence type of relationship. And yeah, I was one of those little popular girls, uh, all in dance team, always outside. And I remember one morning, let me get to the story. One morning I woke up, you know, this is an orphanage. There are hundreds of kids, youth, um, some are young adults, um, staff, and everybody was looking at me. And I was like, what did I do? I, I couldn't even say what did I do. But there is a way people look at you and you feel like I have done something wrong. Definitely. First of all, I look at myself. Did I pee on myself? Uh, did maybe my clothes are ripped? I was like, what did I do? Like I'm working, you know, I just wake up, took a shower, stepped outside and all eyes on me. I can never forget that day, that moment. I still, you know, whenever I remember that, I can see where I was standing or oh, eyes on me. It's like 20,000 eyes on you. I'm like, what did I do? And when I was thinking about the definition of shame, I was like, this is the right definition of shame because you have to feel it to understand it. And... I kept asking what happened, what happened? And I think somebody had the courage to tell me, apparently somebody has spread the rumors about something I have done. And it was wrong, it was not true. It was a rumor of something apparently I have done with another boy and it was not true. I was sleeping the entire night, I was young, I was eight. And I am not gonna lie to you, I felt I felt like, you know, can I disappear? Can I be invisible? I feel like I was melting. I feel like, you know, it feels like, you know, I feel I feel like I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I was like, what is happening? And you can't call all these hundred people to tell them they're lying. This is not true. And all of that, it was like, you know, there's nothing else you can do. So I shared this story. I think I've experienced many moment of work of shame in my life and I still experience it but as we talk um there are also many um victories in really handling shame because I believe shame such moments like that can really make us feel like I want to disappear even as we become adult being you know I, I I love being in public settings from the young age I love it but I'm telling you you know I am a beginner, I am learning, but all the time I think that story 
kept running in my mind every single time I felt like, you know, people who know me can think like, you know, you are confident, you, you are fearless, you can, but every single time I am in public settings, I am doing anything in public, I, I always feel like, you know, I am melting. So when I think um, about this story and you might have your own story, think about your own story where you feel like, you know, oh my goodness, have you actually ever felt ashamed? When I was doing research, they said that most of the time women and adolescents actually experience shame more than um, other um, people. And uh, I, I could see most of the time, you know, adolescents are always shy in a way, but I was like, you know, to tell, it's easy to, to define something, but shame is something you have to feel to define it. And when I was looking into definitions, you know, um, some researchers were suggesting that shame is an uncomfortable sensation we feel in the pit of our stomach when it seems we have no safe heaven from the judging gaze of others. And I think this is bringing back where I started from, the judgment of others. And I feel like many of us, we are not sent. Many times we judge others. So when it comes to shame, it's something that comes from outside and we make it our own. We, we, we really accept it and allow our body to feel bad about a situation. But when you look closely, it comes from judgment. And when we feel small and bad about ourselves, we get a feeling or a wish that we could vanish. And when I was looking into this, I was like, oh my goodness, this is so sure, sure, real. And some of the root shame they were talking about were that most of the time shame is instilled in early childhood by, you know, it can be from harsh words that were told, it can be from actions from our uh, primary caregivers or other authority figures. It can be from bullying by, by peers, um, you know. And also, you know, it is important to know that shame is not always a negative, is not always associated with negative feelings. Because you know, I was saying that shame is not always associated with negative emotions all the time. Shame sometimes can be necessary for our human emotion to help us develop, you know, a moral compass but it can also be a destructive, it can also be destructive in our lives, especially when it comes no meeting the societal norms and which is the biggest part that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be touching in this moment. And before I move on to sharing, you know, how to break the circle of shame and all of that, I also, Shame is something that can make us believe that we have to be perfect or else we are not lovable. Shame might make us or lead us to withdraw from others. It can cause us to be defensive and distant. And again, there are many areas that one can discuss, but I wanted to start, to start with these, like, you know, areas to really show how shame can make someone feel in their bodies so that we can actually understand how 
heavy this emotion is, how it is so dangerous when we judge people, when we cause people to feel ashamed. Again, I say this because there have been a conversation, especially in our community, talking about, you know, especially slut shaming, uh, slut shaming, like, you know, women talking about, like, you know, women, especially when we see successful women or thinking that they can be successful without support of men. They can be su successful without sleeping with men. And I think recently we had the guest on our podcast who shared how she was sexually abused during the genocide against the Tutsi. And whenever people could see her, it was all the time, oh, her identity, her, her pain or her, the violence that happened to her, the society managed to make that violence into her identity, which is dangerous. When they look at her, instead of, you know, I was looking at her, Bio, like which is a long bio. This woman has spoken to the UN to many major areas, but you still see people who define her as, oh, look at that girl who was raped. Like then we the society want that to become her identity, to become one single story to identify her. And I think like you know, I've been we've been looking into many stories. There is this one case that I follow for many days for the last few weeks. Um, it was from the Rwandan community. They were analyzing these women who want to do a reality show and talking about how, like, you know, how are they rich? Uh, they, they get their money from men and all of that. Regardless of the reality of their lives or anything, which many of people don't even have proof of anything, I, I was really, you know, I joined and I saw over 1,300 people sitting, talking about, is it four or five women? And most of the time, even the speakers of those space, the main speakers are women. And I don't wanna really, I'm someone who's dedicated all the time. I will never ever, I, I, I train myself and do so hard not to judge anyone or criticize, although, um, we can be human sometimes and not do, do, do so well. But I'm like, you know, 1,300 people talking about, you know, or talking or listening about the rights of women or some of the questions are like, you know, they have to show where they got their money from. And I'm like, do you know some of these men can be getting the money from the wrong sources as well? but we never talk about it. Or think about like, you know, a woman who, a lady, a young lady who get pregnant out of wedding um, before they get married. How is the conversation? They think about so many conversations here in the community about stories of rape how we shame women who come forward, who share their stories, how we make them feel small. And at the end of the day, when those in power, those with the power manage to get away with their crime, it feels like, you know, because there was no conviction, then this woman was lying. And how I was sharing the story of feeling like, you know, melting, this is actually um, one of the core emotional shame is the self-conscious emotion arising from the sense that something is fundamentally wrong about oneself. It's how, when and, and how we make others feel like there's something wrong about myself. And I'm not gonna lie to you, as I was sharing a story with you, I was eight years old, I still carried that story. And there are moment, many moments I question, is there something wrong about myself? And as an adult, you know, thank God for the blessing, the privilege of spaces like, you know, um, faith community, therapy, friendship, 
that help you to build confidence. One of the things I tell people is I am learning so much to show up in areas that I've been ashamed so that I can face that face to face so that I can really remind the shame that I belong here. There's nothing wrong with me. And it takes so much work. And most of the time, many people we, we, we shame or those words we use online to bully people, it can take forever or sometimes not everybody get a chance. We have heard stories of suicide from bullying, shaming. So let me get into more details, but I wanted to start with this part so we can really be mindful when we judge people, even if they have different faith, different beliefs, different understanding, different ideology, respect is the minimum and kindness you can always offer to people because you never know how shaming someone, it can make them really feeling more melting and all of that. So let's go into strategies, details, and one way to understand shame is to make a difference between shame and guilt. I think a simple way, like a simple way to understand shame tells you I am bad, while guilt tells you I did something bad. And they, while they can, be looked at almost similar things, but they really provide different feelings and emotions. So feeling like, you know, I'm bad, I'm wrong, or I did something wrong and bad, those are two different things. So, and before maybe we make a difference between the two is, I wanna share this quote by Brené Brown. And I love it so much because she gives to, things, how the shame makes you feel, and actually one way you can really overcome or survive shame. She said that if you put shame in a, in a, in a petri dish, it needs three ingredient, ingredients. To grow, okay, if you put shame in a petri, in a petri dish, it needs three ingredients to grow. It needs secrecy, silence, and judgment. And I think I spoke a lot about judgment, the relationship between judgment and shaming. So two ingredients can make shame growing, secrecy and silence and judgment. So if you have experienced shame, starting to feel like, you know, what is wrong with me, what happened is, you start hiding. That's one. Of, that's part of the ingredient of secrecy, hiding. Oh my God, I hope nobody will ever know that. And sometimes we, we are even afraid to break out of some of the challenging moments of our lives because we are so afraid of what the society is going to think. By the way, do you know that most of the time our fear to to take risk comes from what other people think, not necessarily who we are or our capacity or what we can do. And secrecy, seeking to hide, that's something that makes shame grow. And then you go from secrecy, hiding to silence. Maybe it's better if I don't talk about it. I'll be safe. I'll bury this until I leave this earth. I'll be safe. But all those things do not really actually break the cycle. They keep growing it. And then uh, Brené Brown added that if you put the same amount of shame in the petri dish and douse it with empathy, it can't survive. I was like, this is so beautifully well put together. But she said that shame is that what feelings that wash, washes over us 
making us feel small, flawed, and never good enough. So two important things, and I feel like we can even conclude the conversation here. One way to grow shame is to hide, is to have to be silenced, or to be silenced, and is to judge. That means there are two parts here. Judging means we are causing someone to feel ashamed. We don't want to cause them to start hiding. Just be quiet. We have so many stories of abuse really silenced because people like, I'd rather be, you know, be silent than speaking up and having an entire community making me feel small, nothing, not good enough. And we really have to check into ourselves. When I look at how we shame people, how we shame victims of many violence, I'm like, you know, what are we learning as human being in 2020? How can you organize a conversation around shaming someone. I'm gonna tell you something. People might be doing things that you think they're wrong. Oh my God, no man should do this. Oh my God, no man should do this. Do you know their stories? I remember when I was taking in my undergrad a course about social inequalities. I remember this professor would put us in group and give us case studies. And she'll be like, you know, how can you change um, the life of this person. And all the cases were so complicated, the only way out, when you look at their cases, it was like the only way out, someone has to commit a crime to survive. There is no, really no way out. You, We will look into every angle. Every angle had the barrier that the only way was to start accept that this person committed this crime because there was nothing. I remember this case study that we worked on this guy from Harlem, he wanted to be into law school, grew up in a project, and he was like, I'm not going to be like this. I'm going to, you know, change my life, change my family. I'm going to become a lawyer. He was very dedicated, and then he went to, the, to college. He's like, I'm going to work a night shift, daytime, go to school, pay for my uh, school fees and all of that. Guess what? in their community where they come from, um, in their areas, there is no, there are technically no good jobs around. The only thing you can do is either go work in fast food restaurant or wash dishes in a restaurant. It was really close to nothing. And the job is paying maybe $11 an hour. It's not enough money to take care of the mother, go to school and all of that. And in the middle of that, the guy's mom got cancer, and apparently in America, it's very difficult. The healthcare system is very difficult. He had to really provide for the mother so she can access treatment and all of that. The money he's working for is not enough. And the guy who wanted to be a lawyer to change his life, he can look at his dream really being destroyed. And some of the gang from the community approach team, they're like, you know, selling drugs, you can be getting up to 3,000 a week. The guy's like, you know, if I get 3,000 maybe in about three months, I don't get caught, I can pay my, in my university and take care of my mother, and then I will get out of the circle of selling drugs. But unfortunately, once he started that, there's no way to stop her going back. So. When we were looking to that case study, I was like, oh my goodness, telling someone, oh, don't go into drugs, but then there are no jobs around in the community close to them that can help him go to school, after school, go straight to work. There are really no good job enough, especially that at that time, most of jobs requires two, three years experiences and all of that. So when you hear the story of a such young man without knowing their background, it's easy to say, Wow, this is a drug dealer. You look at them, you call them drug dealer. But you don't know that behind the face of a drug dealer, there is a young man who 
who really want to become a lawyer, who really want to take care of um, his mother, who really want to change his community, but he's trying everything and there are so many barriers to escape. So when you look at these young women or me, women with shame, um, ways they, whatever they do to really survive this capitalism, let me get straight to the point. Life is very difficult. Life is very, very difficult. And you get to women most of the time, and we can know that's how Me Too movement was here. Most of the time women, if you don't have a connection, family, uh, close friends to get a job, it's not easy, especially in the corporate world dominated by male. For most of women you approach, they, they, you know, you might be asked to exchange that with men asking you to sleep with them, things like that. You know, those are one of thousands of stories. Young girls who grew up, no support, especially let's see where we come from, uh, uh, you know. Um, when we started Gen 365, we want to connect different community, but I, I'm going to speak right now someone who comes from Rwanda. Look our history, where we come from. Many, to the genocide, there were so many orphans who were actually left to even become parents of other kids at the young age. No support, no backup, no family member, no uncles, no one. And when you see some of these women or men doing anything to survive, or what we can do is sitting in space talking about how they're prostitutes, talking about how they're, it's actually this conversation. And I'm going to tell you, and the, the, the talking part is how we talk about women, but this situation, we also see them among men, but we never approach that the same way we approach women. So it is important to analyze ourselves and be like, one thing I like psychotherapy or even psychology or even in the field of diagnosing, diagnosing mental illnesses, one thing is that Diagnosing someone is something, but without knowing their background history is actually making a huge mistake, knowing the history that led them to where they are. Because there's always, a, I'm going to tell you one thing, there's always a story. There's always a story behind anything that you don't understand. Just because you don't understand someone, just because you don't understand the source of income of someone, just because you don't understand how someone operates, it doesn't mean that you know them. You have to check your assumptions. Actually, someone said perspective of other people towards you is actually who they are. They are reflecting, they are projecting who they are and trying to use that to define you. If you are good, love people, have empathy. One thing I had to train myself, especially uh, being in this field of psychotherapy, is recognizing that every human being, there's two things. Every human being, my philosophy is that every human being is redeemable and every human being is defined, just by, is defined by more than one story. You can just put a person in a box just because, you know, one area of their lives. So, yeah, um, I've been into stories, into anything, but I want to go deep a little bit. Um, you know, shame and guilt are two different things. When we are guilty, we we can feel responsible or remorse for a specific action or behavior that believe that it is wrong or hurtful, hurtful to others. We focus on the action when we are guilty rather than ourselves. But when we are ashamed or when we feel ashamed, we feel embarrassed, humiliated, about ourselves. So guilt can lead us to constructive behavior change, but shame can be destructive 
and lead to negative self-talk, self-blame, self-doubt. There is somebody who said that when you look at someone with that confidence, there's more to tell. It's not because they lack skills. It's not because they were not trained well. They didn't go to school, to the good school. They didn't study the perfect English or French accent. There's always a story behind that. Because when it comes to confidence, someone who grew up secure, um, feeling secure, secured, loved, regardless of how they say things, they do not care. They are confident. They feel like... <laughs> I remember my son when I took him back home, my boys, one of my boys was very confident even going to talk to people in Kenya, Rwanda, very confident. Like I was like, you know, this is what it means to feel secure and confident. But me, when I speak English, I'm turning my head, translating, uh, trying to overthink whatever I'm going to say. So it is perfect. And I'm going to tell you, lack of confidence, moment we're ashamed, all of that can play in how we act in public and how we make decisions. Anyhow, some of the triggers that, some of the triggers of shame and how you can recognize them, it can be rejection, failure, criticism, even the feeling to be, um, Perfect. Those are, you know, how do you feel when you fail on something? How do you feel when you get criticized? How do you react or how do you feel when you get rejected? Those are some of the triggers that can really, that can trigger shame and any situation that anyone else can 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 just accept it in a normal way, be like, you know, oh, you know what, I felt this part, but I will try again tomorrow. But shame, then when it kicks in, it's like, oh my goodness, I hope nobody knows that I got to percent. I hope nobody knows that I got dumped. I hope nobody knows that I got divorced. I hope nobody knows that I got pregnant. I hope nobody knows that I got, you know, you are that. So those things can really trigger shame. And shame, can, then when those things trigger shame, it can be manifested in different ways, like, you know, feeling unworthy, inadequate, where you feel like, you know, I think me, some of the ways I remember last Saturday at one of my friends' baby shower, people were saying, oh, you look good, you look good. And I'm focusing on the fact that I gained weight instead of receiving, oh, thank you so much. You are beautiful. But Shane is telling me, oh my God, is that true? You are beautiful. Lydia, you gained so much weight. How can you be beautiful? And then I, ref I had to slow down because I realized that I was doing so much negative self-talk and I was explaining myself, oh my God, I wish all of that. And then I told my friend, you know what? I'm going to stop this. This is not okay. When people tell me I look good, I'm beautiful, I'm going to say thank you. That's how we start, as Brené Brown said, when we start using empathy, self-compassion, shame cannot survive. And some of the strategies we, oh, before we go to strategies, I wanted to say, you can recognize when shame is starting to take a hold. So how are you gonna recognize when shame is starting to take a hold of you is when you start experiencing or feeling those physical symptoms, negative self-talk. Like what I did at the baby shower, oh, three people tell me I'm beautiful, I look nice, but I'm saying, oh my God, I can't wait, wait until some I'm gonna be better. Three times, that's the beauty of therapy. When we go to therapy, doesn't mean that our triggers are gonna go away. 
we then we learn how to recognize it. Many people say that, oh, I don't want to go to therapy because my problems are not going to be away. Actually, the goal of therapy is not taking your problems away, but it's helping you to become resilient and learning tools that you can use to really handle uh, those triggers, to really handle any negative emotion that affect you. So in my situation, um, being... Uh, negative self-talk, then after three times I recognize it, then I started saying, thank you. I know deep in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, is that true? Are they lying? Because that's how I'm starting to recognize, oh, shame is starting to take a hold on me. I refuse that. I'm not gonna allow it to survive. How I do not allow it to survive? By stopping the negative self-talk. Learning how to receive. When people tell you are beautiful, thank you. And without even the need to say that, oh, thank you too. It's okay. Receive love for that moment when you receive to give back the same love, choose another time. And some of the strategies, and I think I talked more about this as I was saying in, you know, in the earlier conversation. Some of the strategies that we can use to break the shame circle is actually through practicing self-acceptance. I think that, may, you know, I don't want to conclude or confirm this, but I think one of the main treatment that you can ever, ever use is actually learning the self-acceptance, empathy, having empathy, you know, and what we can do to help people break the circle of shame is really being empathetic, being, you know, showing them empathy. And self-compassion, I think that was a powerful word of Brené Brown saying that. Self-empathy, we not allow shame to survive. If you ever, if you ever been ashamed, use some of the, um, Affirmation. Affirmations are so good. Repeat them until you make your brain to believe it. One beautiful thing about our brain is that it believes whatever we say. That's why in, in psychology, especially in um, DBT, when in psychotherapy, when we are helping clients using the, the DBT approach, is recognizing that when we are in control of our thoughts, we can overcome our emotions. Because what happens most of the time, actually most of the time we go in therapy because we are not able to be in control of our emotions. And one of the powerful tools is to actually tell our mind the, the, the opposite thing of what it tells us. Because especially in depression, uh, going through tough time, there's so many lies going through our mind, so many negative thoughts. And I'm going to tell you when we use your tongue to say, to, to, to tell our brain different. Let's see, my brain is telling me, like the example of the baby shower, oh my God, Lydia, you can wait. I don't think you look good. Then I say, I am beautiful. I am worthy. I belong here. And more I say that, actually, it's like one way of tricking your brain, more your brain really believes that, more your brain really starts then changing the way it talks to you or it communicates to you. And another strategy is, yeah, I think I just said it, what I, what I was saying is like, you know, how we challenge our negative talk and replace, replace it with positive affirmations. So... If you won't have any positive affirmation by use, check out Beyond the Veil Mission page on, page on social media. Every Monday, we call them Beyond Those Affirmation. You can actually even take a screenshot and say it to yourself. Some people can use, like, you know, um, scriptures. People can use, like, you know, some positive words. Um, you know, I have some, like, my youngest son, every time I take him to the bus, I have this affirmation that we, we we say as we go to the past, I have him repeat this. I am this, I am this. Especially I like when we, I like having him repeat the Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd 
and he's used to it and sometimes when I forget he's like oh mom let's say that let's say that so positive affirmation is one way to change your negative thought and it actually the other strategy we can use is exploring the role of vulnerability and authenticity in breaking the shame circle so in order to build stronger uh, relationship being vulnerable is actually one of the good way to help us overcome or break the circle of the circle of the shame circle the, sorry breaking the the the, the shame circle because we saw that at the beginning there are three things that make the, the shame grow and one of those there's silence so when we are vulnerable to really and we allow ourselves to feel safe enough. To feel safe enough, you have to identify that people you feel safe enough around. You you have, you know, if you console on our podcast, he, she said, you must have a person who listens to your heart. You have a person who listens to your heart. If you have that lucky person, um, I think there's another, another author who said, a friend or a person where whenever you, you go to them, you you can feel free feeling naked. When they say naked, it's not taking off your clothes, but you feel like you can talk to them fully and you are so free that it feels like you're so naked in front of them. If you have such a friend, being vulnerable to them, your fears, what makes you feel ashamed can help you break the shame circle and also another way strategy we can use is talk about the value um i think i touched that um uh, peer support friends family that can give you perspective and encouragement i think there's another guest we had at least she said sometimes i go to my friends for validation Ask them how they see me. What are the good things they see about me? Sometimes I do that with my kids. I tell them we're going to pick a name from one of us and we're going to tell them good things about them. So it is important. Don't wait for people to give you compliments. Sometimes ask your friend, tell me what are my strengths? What do you like about me? Or maybe tell me some of the good things you see in me so I can remember that when I feel small when i feel like you know i'm melting in in the face of shame so in concluding i will um i will provide some of the way we can cultivate a sense of self-worth and self-love and it's through discussing the you know everything i talk it leads us back to the self-compassion we have to discuss about that often. Those Twitter space that we call to charge and talk about people, let's talk about self-compassion, self-worth, self-love, self-acceptance. How do we practice that? Share with us on our social media, how do you practice self-love, self-worth? And those things can help you to improve your mental health it does not matter how other people see you, but what we tell ourselves in the secret place, those things are so important to our mental well-being. And what I was into the research, one thing is that shame actually can put, shaming people can, shame can put uh, people at risk of developing depression and anxiety. And I can tell how, because you know, when you look at anxiety, Things like, you know, social anxiety. And with shame, it can make sense that when we feel like, you know, we want to hide, we are not worthy, and we build those negative thoughts, it can really lead us over the time in depression and anxiety. And I want to say that we're going to start, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you've been ashamed, but I'm going to encourage you to build and start practicing self-acceptance through affirmations and, and also mindfulness. Some of the practical steps that you can 
uh, back to back the shame circle is practicing mindfulness. Mindfulness is the action or the act of being present in the moment, slowing down and just being present in the moment, trying to disconnect from the world around us and being present in the moment and turning inward to connect with ourselves. For faith believers, it will be to go inwards to connect with our creator and allow him to really guide us and fill us. And, and actually it benefits so much our mind to relax, to pause and to make better decisions. Another practical step we can take is learning how to set boundaries. I'm gonna leave three things. I think we have a discussion of boundaries in the future. Boundaries, we verbalize them, we communicate them, and we put them in actions. Most of the time when you set boundaries, boundaries, it's, it brings peace of mind because it's telling people how to respect our needs. And the problem is most of the time we verbalize them, but we don't communicate them. It's easy to say, I don't like when, it, when it's a good example. But tell my kids, when I'm working, I do not like when you come in my office without knocking at the door. I am verbalizing one of the boundaries that I want to establish that my kids must know that they have to knock at the door when they come in my office. Guess what? That's it. Then communicating it when I'm working, I might be talking to my client, there's sensitive information. It is important to respect my work environment. So my kids have to understand why. And then if I verbalize this, I communicate this, and then they break, they break the boundaries, then I come up with action. Next time, if you come in my office without knocking at the door, I'm gonna have to ground you. It can be you're gonna lose maybe uh it can be you know we 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 can ground kids in different options. I don't wanna give any example. I don't want anyone to be like, oh, this is the right way to grab people to discipline kids. I, I'm not gonna share that part, but I'm saying then if I put an action, I'm gonna ground you if you do this. It means that next time they do it, I'm not gonna look at the cute first and be like, oh, if you do this next time, no, I'm gonna put whatever I communicated in action so they can learn. So most of the time as human being, people fail to respect, especially this happened a lot in relationship, romantic relationship, husband, wives, or boyfriend, girlfriends, um, or whatever romantic, because we verbalize, we communicate, but we don't put in action our boundaries. So it is important. Setting boundaries can help us to break the shame circle. And also identifying and prioritizing self-care. So actually self-care, I think self-care goes hand in hand in setting boundaries because self-care is recognizing your needs. This is my moment, this is my me time and having people around you respect that and I think like everything we talked about, self-acceptance, self-care, self-worth, all of that, I think we can achieve that when we are able to set boundaries. Boundaries, many people are afraid to set boundaries because they think it's uh, pushing people away, but actually boundaries create more peace in relationships because people know how to treat others, how to respect others' needs, and be considerate because sometimes we focus on what what our needs, but we don't look at other people's needs. So um, the last part is the role of gratitude. And I think I'm gonna close on this one. 
gratitude is so important. It's so important in cultivating self-acceptance, breaking the shame circle, and it can help us to shift our focus to positive aspect of our lives. So being grateful is really important in breaking the shame. It's one of the practical tools we can use. Mindfulness, setting boundaries, prioritizing self-care, and then being grateful. So you might have been ashamed or you might have caused shame, but I'm gonna encourage you to move forward with courage to choose to do better tomorrow or, or either for others or to do better for yourself. Do better for others is deciding to stop shaming others because you don't know people's story behind what they do. It does not matter. Even if you don't understand, you don't know people's story. So it is not up to you to judge. And taking action as someone who's been shamed is deciding to loving on yourself, deciding to prioritizing self-care, mindfulness, waking up without rushing, taking a deep breath. I love the belly breathing because they help us to regulate our nerve system. And that's one of the beauty, um, mindful practice that you can add in your daily routine. Um, so I encourage you, especially the those of being grateful, what are you grateful about yourself? What are you grateful about others? Who are the people supporting you on your healing journey? Who are you grateful for? So thank you so much for listening and please share with anyone who struggled, who has been shamed. Did you relate to anything? And I know I said so many things, but I hope you were encouraged and I wish you all the best. And uh, yes, thank you. <laughs>